Well, good afternoon and welcome back. This is Mike Harris broadcasting on www.veteranstoday.com, also broadcasting on www.freedomslips.com, Studio B, Revolution Radio. Today is Thursday, February 18th, 2016, and uh, for this uh, section of the show, the next hour and a half, we've got two guests. We've got uh, you know my, my dear friend, Dr. Richard Allen Miller, and we have uh, Mr. Nick Begich with us. So, uh, gentlemen, welcome. Hey, Rick, how are you? I'm uh, good, Mike. This is, uh, it's more tinny and telephone, but it's better. Skype is broader. It's just uh, with the coronal mass that's going on right now. You know, most Comcast is down everywhere. Uh, well, here's uh, Nick Duggett. Hey, Nick, how are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. It's good to be with you today. Well, it's good to have you, and one of the reasons that you're in the neighborhood here, I'm down in Ashland, uh, Rick's up in Grants Pass, is that you're speaking uh, this Friday night in Ashland, Oregon, correct? Yeah, we're, I'm going to be speaking tomorrow night at, from 7 to 9 in, uh, in Ashland, and it's a uh, relatively small venue, only about, um, I guess it's about uh, 80 people, and where it's going to be is the, um, the Haven at uh, 1970 Ashland Street. Okay. Well, you know what? I, I know right where that is. So uh, maybe I'll see you Friday night. Well, that would be great. It would be good to always meet you personally. You know, so, so much of the time you don't get to meet the uh, guys you do radio with, so it's nice to be traveling around a little bit and get to see some of the people that I work with over the years. <laughs> well, that, that's why that's why I made a point when I was up here to, to look uh, Rick Miller up is because, uh, you know, I talked to him on the radio a few times. And when I when I got to the area, I wanted to make sure I connected with him because I think uh, nothing replaces a, uh, a face to face, eye to eye, belly to belly meeting with somebody. Yeah, I agree with you totally. It's always nice to do that. Put a put a person to the uh, voice on the other end of the radio. Right. And, and I've known Rick quite a while. And uh, in fact, uh, Kind of, he started writing again after a little stall out for a while. <laughs> well, he was at my place in Alaska, um, and, I, and I'm glad to see he's cranking out some pretty good work these days. So it's always good to see Rick uh, when I'm in this part of the country as well. Well, well, good. Well, you know, well, welcome to Oregon. So uh, glad you're here. And uh, like I said, I look for, forward to uh, maybe coming down and, and listening uh, to your to your presentation on Friday. So, so, so look forward to meeting you personally. Mike, are you coming Saturday or not? I don't know yet, Rick. Uh, ask me on Saturday. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. I don't know yet. Ask me on Saturday. Yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the way life. <laughs> you know, I don't know what kind of curveballs I'm going to be throwing between now and then. But, uh, but gentlemen, you know, uh, Rick, you had a little bit of news for me earlier today. Let, let's talk about the coronal mass ejection first of all. Let's talk about the effects that that's having across the country. Oh, yeah, no, a couple of days ago, the sun had a big burp, and we got it big time, and Comcast is, uh, at least yesterday and part of today, down everywhere in the United States, mostly on the East Coast. <clears throat> Not a grid down, but Comcast is down, and other uh, radio broadcasting things are all having difficulty, you know. I tried New Zealand. I couldn't do New Zealand at all, even in audio. Okay. All right, so do we do anything else about it? How long has it been going on? How long do we well, anticipate it, this it one? It started day? three days ago, and so this is a large one. It's an unusual one, and something else is going on, and I'll send you some top stuff I got from JPL, and you tell me what you think it is. Well, why don't you pontificate or give us your best educated guess uh, well, since, 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 since we've, we've the got Earth, the listeners on the air? Yeah, I think that the sun is burping out more electrons right now, and so the kind of storm that we're enjoying at this moment is going to wreak havoc on a lot of different um, communication devices right now. Well, so the it's... fact that Nick's here talking about HARP, that's what HARP is about, is when everything else goes down, the Navy still has a way of communicating to their nuclear submarines, <laughs> plus other kinds of weird things that they do. Well, That's what uh, Nick will be talking about, is that kind of thing. Well, uh, eventually we're going to be having another Carrington event. It's just a matter of when. The you Carrington don't... effect, we've actually had three kill shots just in the last three years that just barely missed the Earth. And it would have made the Carrington effect even look way less. There is a movie out right now called The Fifth Wave, where the aliens show up on the planet, and then they, they take it down to the Stone Age. 
um, Matt Stein, you know, using a CMP, you know, an EMP spike. And Matt Stein and I are going to be doing an urban survival skill workshop in Hollywood, a three-day event that the city is sponsoring because they're trying to prep the, their constituency on what to do when you have no power and municipalities can't deliver water. What are you going to do? And that is how about to happen. And what we're doing right now with our communication hassles and shit like that, it basically, here we are, the end of days. And um, it's going to happen. There are going to be some more things happening. What and when? Good luck on that. Cliff High. <laughs> Did you hear what Cliff High had to say? No, I, mean, I That I was really weird, man. Cliff High called me the other day and wanted to talk to me and ask me if I had encryption. And I said, no. And he said, I'll get back to you. And it had well, to well, do with time travel. Well, I'll tell you what, Rick. Uh, you know, I, I do have <laughs> access to encryption. And, and if you need 384 uh, NSA quality encryption, I can put you in touch with the vendor. And, well, uh, I, I don't have any money. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'll, 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 we'll get you a complimentary uh, a copy to a evaluate. complimentary, yeah. Kind of like what Apple was asked to do for the FBI. There we are. <laughs> well, it, it, this is this is above and beyond what the FBI or the NSA can contend with, and this has been developed by a group out of MIT, and uh, it, it's ready to go to market. We're we're expecting to have it out here uh, very very quickly. You know well, what's happening is Lockheed's teleportation laser, and the one that does, drops information in group doubles, so it cannot need encryption. It drops it into specific packages, no longer needing encryption. And that's Lockheed's latest development called a teleportation laser. And, you know, the whole thing has to do with what we've just discovered about gravity waves. This is going to revolutionize our whole thinking in the field of physics and where we're going. It's, um, it, it's unbelievable. Keshe, I know you wanted to talk about Keshe. Well, he was, just on, he was just on in the previous um, half hour. What's that? He was just on in the previous half hour announcing a, a conference he's ha I'll having he uh, <laughs> April 21st and 22nd in Dubai. So you're invited if you want to go. No, thank you. I, <laughs> I've had enough, uh, what is that called, um, anomalous circumstances in my life. I don't need any more I, I, controlled substances. I'm no, I do not want to go to Dubai or anything. I'd okay. rather stay here in Oregon and be in the free state of Jefferson. Good luck. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of the state of Jefferson myself. I think it's time. Yeah. There's a movie on the free state of Jefferson that takes place in 2025 called Black Road. It just came out, and that's worthwhile. The reason I said the fifth wave is that the third wave is a pandemic. Guess what the fifth wave is. Um, go ahead Here's and tell our me. children, like they did in Rwanda, to do mop-up of all survivors. And actually, the movie itself is Hollywood, so it's really cool. It has a good ending, then, where the kids figure it out <laughs> and turn the tables on the aliens. And it's kind of like V, where they have to big lines and march back into their ship and go back to wherever they went and... You know, that kind of thing with all our children, that they're training how to be little mercenaries. Okay. Well, anyway. It's I'll, a creepy I'll, movie, I'll and the reason it's creepy is that this morning I posted a new one that's coming out, like X-Files, the 10th series, where it's no longer about aliens. It's about alien technology and a creepy old men. Okay. That's <laughs> what. That's where the story is going today with Hollywood. We're talking about the creepy old men who currently run the world. Well, those guys, yeah, maybe they're alien. I don't know about that fourth genome and blood types. Go ahead and stay tuned on that third genome, fourth genome. But, yes, that guy, and a uh, singular. And it gets weirder. There's a new thing, movie coming out called... Uh, Amerigeddon. <laughs> it's got all your usual suspects from, you know, pandemics and no food, uh, zombies. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm concerned 
because imagination is reality, and actually we're going to have to take some responsibility here for creating our own aliens and apocalypse. And that was uh, Joseph Campbell when he said, when you see the kingdom of the Father on earth, the apocalypse has already occurred. It is perpetual in its potential. And really, we're creating all of this as we're going along. And that's why they call it the physical plane. <laughs> it's where you go to be sick spiritually. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, gotcha. Uh, actually, that is an accurate way of looking at things. And where I was going with Keshe, by the way, was to talk about the difference between a closed system and an open system. And really, Keshe and the rest, when you talk about the Omega Principle, the energy which patterns randomness, that's a paper that I wrote that's in the Non-Local Mind book. And really, what that's about is the concept of how you structure water you know, with your thoughts and actions. And uh, it's, uh, I'm seeing it now in every single kind of form. It's actually, in the next century, our double, double ganger concept of white holes and black holes and uh, uh, what do we call that Taurus Twister space of ben, Penrose. That is going to lead us to a whole new concept of Middle Earth. Okay. So so there really is a hollow catching. earth in there. Okay, yeah, I know I'm, I'm getting it all. I mean, your 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 quality, like you said, is telephone tenny, but your every word is uh, is coming through loud and clear. Okay, well then, the whole the whole idea is we have a responsibility for the thoughts we choose to entertain, and so I'm living now in a much different environment, and I've noticed that my universe is also slowly changing. It has to do with belief systems and how you choose to arbitrarily see something. Okay. I um, I have no idea what the Republican Party means anymore, Michael. I, <laughs> no, you know what? I, 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 don't, I don't either. And, I've and, ever seen. And, and you know what? I used to be a, a, a pretty devout Republican. You know, I was, I know. I was, I, I was <laughs> finance chairman. One time. What? I was finance Evan. chairman for the for the ninety four election cycle. I ran they for governor of Arizona. Tea party. That's what they did. They threw everything in the sea. Well, um, no, I, I what I think they did is I think they sold themselves to the highest bidder, and that was Sheldon Adelson, the the the, the gangster who uh, fled the country from a cow to avoid prosecution. Hillary Clinton should be in prison, and actually, what she did was le- was more than the last one they executed. Get a grip. Oh, I know. Bill Clinton is the worst criminal to ever come out of Arkansas. There's a bridge with his name on it that carries drugs and wrap at either end. I've seen, you know, I've got a federal judge talking about all of that. When uh, it, the only reason Hillary isn't in prison right now is because she's running for president. <laughs> Well, I don't. I don't think that should spur out because if you it's and I, scary. if you and I the get two percent, Democrats and all Ron Paul, the whole thing's nuts. Our well, president it, is supposed to represent our best, most educated, and morally correct. And the United States, as a government, has never kept a single treaty they've ever given to anyone. How did the Paiute put it in uh, Burns, Oregon? Stand in line. Yeah. Yeah, stand in line. You yeah, in line. well, here we are. You know, and everything's infiltrated, which means you can't believe anything that you're saying or hearing. Now nope, you can I, deal I with, with people you've known 10 years. That's a good place to start. Who do you want to be in the bunker with? You know, at the oh, that, end of that's, days. That, that, that's the question. Who do you want to be in the bunker with? I, I've, got, I've got a few good choices. I know. They're all female, aren't they? Dogs and... Uh, <laughs> oh, you're killing uh, Working dogs. You're killing me. Um, Michael. Anyway, uh, let's, let's talk about what's going on at Indian Point, because you, you mentioned that up uh, earlier today. Indian but... Point is so bad that my concerns as a physicist is... There's probably people that are already dead in New York. It is only 22 miles away. Como has just today declared a national, not local, regional, national disaster. It's like going to be on the level of Chernobyl worse. And it's 22 miles from New York City, and the tritium is already in the drinking water. 
Okay, so do you think it was an accident? Was it this deliberate? What They're measuring take? it. There's uh, the energy, the energy News has got a whole series of articles on it this morning. It's not cool. With, you know, and I, nobody knows. I don't know. I know that all the Daiichi-like plants in America are leaking. Every single one of them, including Tennessee Valley Authority down in, in Asheville. Well, well, Rick, we, we've had this discussion on the air many times, and that is, uh, you know, if, if I was dictator for a day, I'd shut everyone in the world down. Well, that, uh, you have to do that, and, and, and that's and, and, just and, even sure that the seventh epoch is even possible. Sh- sh- shut them all down. And, well, uh, and, I mean, and, 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 after we're all again, gone and again, dead, you know, and we call out of caves the sort of seventh epoch, there's nothing to call out of except the black slime mold, what they call black goo, you know, from Galactic Center. I'm concerned, and I'm concerned that nobody's getting it. It's like boiling the frog. The frog will never know that it's getting too hot until it's too late if you turn the heat up slow. Mm -hmm. And when you watch chemtrails dropping things down and you look around two years later that everything is dying, all all the trees have death on it now. You can see it. Why are we not saying something about it? That's what Nick's doing Friday night. Well, you know, uh, you know, in Ashland, the Oregon Blue Skies Project. Listen, nobody is wa- everybody is waiting for somebody else to do something. It's not going to work like that. Well, well, Rick, you know, guys like you and I, we do something every day. Guys like Nick. Uh, do something every day. We all do this. this. This is something we work on continually. It's the rest of the people out there. How do we motivate the other seven and a half billion people on this planet to do the right thing? Theoretically, if you're enlightened, that should be the enlightenment of the universe. That's the way that works, according to my Bible. And so, as long as you're doing it, and you is the person I'm talking to, as long as you're doing it, it'll happen. That's how it works. Well, I, I hope it's happening quick enough. That's all oh, I can say. I hope. <laughs> the last evil in Pandora's box. See, the way ESP works is not that you hope it works. It's that you assume it. And the moment you make the assumption is when it happens. Mm-hmm. That's because of the relationship of time in a cavitation ball. The past and the future are actually the into, the out of. They're totally, absolutely, simply connected with the present. And that mm-hmm. present is called the moment. And when you get involved where you're, like, caught up in a timeless motion, that's where the poetry happens. And so here we are. <laughs> Take responsibility for the thoughts you choose to entertain. That is what colors our reality. Okay. Words of wisdom there, folks. Live by them. Well, I don't know about the wisdom part. I'm just hammering myself into submission to believe it. I mean, what else have I got to do? I mean, it's crazy. I, you know, I don't have the answers. I know I don't know. And my pay grade would suggest I probably will never know. That's how it works. <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those, you know... Never ending, never ending. It doesn't work like that. It's well, as, as, like the as, journey. As a, it's not the end of the world. It's it's the journey. As, as a GS eighteen, you had a pretty high pay grade. <laughs> well, yeah, but that is still. What did they call that to the president? Oh yeah, Pl- plausible deniability. <laughs> yeah, no thing yeah. about it. If, if, if you lie to him, he can't tell you the truth, so it's not his fault. <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, that, that, sadly, that is how it works. That yeah. is how it works. And intel, you know, counterintelligence, you know, that guy, yeah, that's by lying, by omission. They don't tell the, a lie. They tell the truth, only they you tell, tell all of Well, Rick, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of that. You know, the, the guy gets off work Friday night. He, uh, he comes home four hours late. And tells his wife he just stopped off for a couple of beers. He didn't tell her he stopped off for a couple of beers and a few table dances at the strip club. <laughs> you know, that's, yeah. that, that, that's a lie by omission. And that, that's what you're talking about right there. It's called the wise 
man says. You know, well, less not, is more. Isn't he that how they rationalize that one? He, he, he won't get now, too I'm much I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I, I've done my tour. It's Nick Begich's turn. All right, Nick, Nick, Nick will be up next. We'll be right back, folks, right after this short break with uh, Nick Begich. So stick around. Be right back after this break. Well, good evening and welcome back. This is Mike Harris broadcasting on www.veteranstoday.com. Also broadcasting on www.freedomslips.com, Studio B Revolution Radio. Today is Thursday, February 18th, 2016. The guests for this hour are Nick Begich and Dr. Richard Allen Miller. So, Nick, welcome to the show. You've got the floor, sir. It's good to be with you. Um, uh, you know, it, it, and, and it's interesting all the things that uh, that are happening in technology today, and you know, kind of what I, my take on it is a little different in the sense of when I look at you know within a republic, within democratic republic at least, when you think about weapon systems and technology, most people go, you know, what does that have to do with me? But it really is what makes governments powerful, and strong in the 21st century. If we look around the world, it's those that control the high technologies that actually control the destiny and direction in which we head. So, you know, from my perspective, we we may not have to all be engineers and know how to build this stuff, but we ought to at least know enough about what the technologies can deliver and start asking the, you know, the questions of, you know, what what should we deliver? Just because we can do something doesn't mean we necessarily should do something. And this is where, you know, within this form of uh, government, at least, we sort of get involved and, and, and engage and actually are supposed to direct the show. And, and when you think about it, think about it from the standpoint of the Congress. And, and my father was in the U.S. House. My brother had been in the U.S. Senate. And here's what happens on the really, really intense technical um, uh, things that are going to change the very way in which wars are fought. They go into a closed conference. Uh, this is a closed committee hearing where staff can't come in. You can't take notes. You can't discuss whatever you learn there with anybody outside of the conference room. And None of those people sitting in that room listening to the dog and pony show or the Air Force or Navy or DARPA or whoever's doing it, they don't have enough intelligence to even know what to ask because they don't have the background. They don't have the science background. They don't have the technical background. And so when you think about oversight, there really isn't any, starting there and then going throughout the bureaucracy and the kind of the attitude of folks within government, whether it be the Pentagon or your local school district is, they don't worry about the local officials. They kind of roll in and out. You know, with the election cycle, the bureaucracies live on 30, 40 years, however long a person's career is. And, you know, you kind of indoctrinate the next generation into how the show runs. And it runs much differently than most people actually recognize. Well, I, I, that, 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 is even worse. that is an extremely legitimate point that I've been making for a very long time, that one of the reasons we have such malmanagement of our country is because, you know, the politicians are window dressing. You know, the Congress has got to be reelected every two years, Senate every six. If, if, right. if they miss one cycle, they're gone. Uh, but the right. bureaucracy that's behind them is, is going to be there for, you know, 30 years or more. Well, for forever, since the founding of the country, you just kind of do the handoff. You know, every generation of bureaucrats sort of hand it off. And there's a lot of nepotism within government stretching back to the revolution. So that there's nothing new in this. It's just, you know, you got to police it differently because now you have the backdrop of, a technological society where virtually everything about you can be tracked and is. And for the government's sake, right, I mean, for our safety and security, I mean, it's the biggest pile of trade-off in terms of national security against personal privacy. Think about it. The, uh, the door to your house in uh, 1776 meant something. Uh, but the door to your digital doorway, where your real information is, is something that's not even in your house. Uh, but that's the doorway into really the perception of who you are as a human being, what you do, and at a higher and higher and greater and greater resolution as uh, the technology gets better, the computing power gets better, and the storage of data gets sort of unlocked going backwards in time as you start to reopen all the data that's been collected and sorted at ra- more rapid rates. And then you apply technology uh, on that, you know, and, and ways of transferring, manipulating energy, all of it, you, you end up with a very different uh, sort of direction in which our republic uh, is headed. And most people are literally unconscious about it, but more importantly, um, the discussion about the technology, technology has been evolving for over 50 years, isn't really happening. And it's not so much about, and, you know, Richard, I listened to his last half hour, which was totally confusing for me, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but here's what I see and what he was trying to say in, in the nutshell of it is the, uh, what, what I see in terms of consciousness and what's happening is we reflect our consciousness in the technology we develop or we try to. We make, mimic nature, whether we're flying in a jet, we're trying to mimic a bird, or whether we're you know, sending information wirelessly from one place to another trying to mimic what we believe is maybe something we do anyway, right? I mean, without a transmission line, so to speak on some esoteric sort of level, what Richard was alluding to. And I think the science, the physics of how the consciousness work kind of bears all that out in, in a lot of different ways. But as creative persons, we have these huge potentials that we manifest in our technology. And at the same time that we're doing all this destructive work around the world with these technologies, we have the potential, um, I think, to turn that a different direction. And I think that's what our hope is and all of that. And that's why you do radio and I do what I do and Richard does what he does. Is to try and see if maybe we can stimulate a little different direction. Well, we're, we're, trying the the we're, we're, we're trying to steer this thing. We're trying to steer this thing in, in a positive direction. But your your earlier point that you made about uh, you know our, our Congress and our Senate who are right. elected to provide oversight to the technology, you right. are spot on. They don't have a clue right. about what the technology does and means. They they are they right. are the deaf dumb blind kids. All they right. care about is raising money to get elected next. Go ahead, rubber right. stamp it. Go on. And well, uh, that now, now they're just getting selected. See, because it's the other guy that spends all the money. I mean, my brother just ran a race in Alaska. He raised three million, you know, and ran a campaign in a small state. But the other guys, you know, in terms of special interest on his side and the opposing side, spent sixty million. So I mean, <laughs> it isn't even about the candidates anymore. It's well, well, Nick, the other Nick, guys. It, it, it's sad to say in this country that ninety-six percent of the time, the candidate with the most money wins. Well, that's true, and I, and I think that's, uh, that is true. That occasionally you see some different things happen, like the canter, if you followed that race. You know, he thought he had it made, and he got bounced out on a 10-to-1 ratio, or worse even for the guy understanding it. And I think maybe that's the sentiment of the times, because you see within the Democratic Party and the uh, Republican Party, both of them kind of fracturing within, you know, I mean, in terms of extremes, within the presidential race, a good example of it, all across the board. And it's really more of people saying, hey, we're tired of the way it's operating and we're sick of the establishment. We don't care which side you represent. And, you know, if you go back historically, you look at something uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote back in the early 70s. He wrote uh, Between Two Wages, which is a kind of a, a discussion of what happens in the future, you know. And he was one of the founders of the Trilateral Commission. Many will remember him, and he was the National Security Advisor to Carter. And what he said back then was as technology advances, it would drive what happens globally. And if you really look at what he wrote then, and he talked about Africa, the Americas, Europe, all of it, Russia, what would eventually happen there, it all happened uh, like it was a history rather than a uh, a forecast back in the uh, 70s. And when you think about technology, and that was his theme there, was how technology would drive the future, it's actually materialized um, as he predicted it would, and even as Huxley did in Brave New World or Brave New World Revisited, which is even better as a revised essay on sort of where technology is taking us. But today, where we are, whether it's the mind effects, which is sort of the extreme side of it, which I lecture on uh, around the world, or you look at the more mundane, you know, recording all the mail that goes through the post office, who it's to and who it's from, or you're recording all your phone traffic or you know, I mean, just layer it up, right? Oh, but we're not going to use it. Don't worry. Yeah, not until you have the subpoena and you go back with some time and look at your no, whole life. Well, like well it Nick, it's, it's 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 worse than, than it's worse than that because now we have businesses out there who are using um, uh, MIS systems and and they're measuring correlations between things that people don't right. even think about. Right. And, 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 and that's all commercial information. I, I wrote a book uh, back in 2000 called Earth Rise and the Revolution, which talked about all of these technologies as they were advancing at that time, kind of made the prediction of where they would go. And it's borne out over the last 16 years. You can read it then and you can read it now. And all of the things that we cited then in terms of how the technologies were emerging and how they were coalescing and what they would turn into has, in fact, happened. You know, the next big leap in this technology was something PBS even did a special on. It's called the Worldwide Mind. It's the idea of connecting, like the Internet's connected today. Imagine everyone's consciousness connected in that way artificially. Whoa. I think it happens anyway. I don't think we need any artificial play on that, but that is, in fact, where the technology goes. When you look at the 
um, Air Force uh, Electromagnetic Director to the Air Force in June 2004. They had a publication, Technology Horizons, where they talked about controlled effects. And these are the idea of stimulating either hardware or software, you know, in terms of computers and machinery, or ultimately the human being being able to artificially create all seven, you know, all of the uh, basic uh, five senses and then adding in even the anomalous ability to manipulate a lot anomalous human capability using energy as sort of the technology of the future. This is where all of the research goes when you start to look at what is it really about. It's a battle for consciousness in the sense of uh, a couple contracts by Follett were for looking at a brain in action, you know, seeing what actually is going on there and being able to measure it, the complex signals that come from it, the emanations that come from it, and then deduce or correlate that with brain thinking, actual thinking and imaging and all of that. And then on the converse of that, being able to artificially create those complex signals and generate them back. So well, I, I, I think to, to induce those signals in someone, uh, you know, uh, Remotely, essentially. I mean, you can right. you, you put, put them in, in uh, put them in the MRI, measure the, what the brain uh, is doing while they're in rage, and then you can right. go ahead and project that upon them. You know, at, at a right. future place, and, and, and right. induce that state whether they want it or not. Right, and you can do that on a gross basis. You know, by looking at large modeling of large populations and then creating those kinds of signals. And, and here's what Persinger said at Laurentian University when he was looking at this. He said you could create a complex signal in the environment that creates that general sense of dis-ease or agitation, and then do something as simple as run your normal press releases through the media at 6 o'clock on the news and point all that energy towards some ethnic group or some latest cause or whatever it is, and a certain amount of energy flows that way. So like in election cycles, 2 or 3 percent matter, that matters. Easily to do, easy, as simple as that, uh, to move the herd, so to speak, by disrupting brain function so they actually move as a herd, because you just have to do that. The simplest way is a little anxiety and a little fear. And if you look at brain activity and an EEG under those conditions, you can't reach higher states of awareness. You cannot reach the states that are associated with creative and intellectual and lateral thinking. You reach the flight or fight response, and you move with the herd. Uh, and that's as simple as it gets. And that type of technology has been around for decades. Uh, and, and even without some electronic version of it. It's, you know, it's the Baptist minister's method on Sunday morning, you know, inject you with enough fear, disrupt your circuits, and you'll run for the run for heaven until Monday morning, you know, when you wake up from your stupor. But the fact is fear as a motivator only lasts so long, and intrinsic motivation based on higher-order thinking is the order of the day. That's the essence of the next revolution, incidentally, from my perspective, is consciousness awakens people then start taking action individually um, and things begin to change. Uh, and it really is that. It's as simple as what Rick was trying to say earlier. I think um, we all do our bit and at the end of the day there's a lot of bits that are up to something. Well, I, I hope that it is all cumulative, you know, because uh, you know, you do what you do, I do what I do, Rick does what he does, and I hope that we're all pulling the rope in the same direction and trying to make some progress. <laughs> that would be good. That would be good, too. Occasionally it doesn't happen that way, but you know what? I think in the long run uh, people do wake up. You know, Americans, I know, we're always like the five minutes to midnight sort of people. You know, we sort of wait till it's really bad, and then it's, you know, get out of the way. And I think we're going to do the same here. I think that's just our nature. Um, but we're going to go through some really rough times. I think that's what we all kind of see also happening right now in terms of how the dollar works, how economies work, the kinds of subject matter I'm sure you cover on your program. And when you look at all that in the bigger picture, we know there's a lot of rough places coming. But on the other end of that is the potential, because human beings, we are pretty good at surviving things and actually evolving from them. Out of our misery comes something new. So let's hope that is the direction that we eventually uh, end up uh, through this next cycle of, of really bad news because it's inevitable. I think the I think we all see it in certain respects, and maybe we can slow that down a little bit, or at least mitigate the damage. <laughs> you know, that's, I think the best we can do is keep trying in that direction. So, right. so what do you, what do you think we're facing? You know, if you could identify what, what the what the top three or four uh, upsets are going to be, what would you guess they were? Um, I would say a couple things. Um, first of all, economics. You know, the dollar is so overinflated. The way currency runs and the way it's manipulated has got a lot of risk in it. Now, what could stop it from just a total freefall at some point is probably another war, and that's real possible, too. 
Um, if you look at the Middle East, look at what's happening there along the Turkish and Syrian border. You look at what's happening in Iran, what's happening with oil supplies, and what's happening with Russia's influence in the Middle East and oil supplies, what's happening with their economy. Just looking at that whole sort of big picture, we've busted the ruble in half over uh, Saudis turning on the taps at the same time, wrapped out, wiped out a big part of the fracking, which is building energy independence for the United States all in one big swoop. And it looks like it was all by accident, but I don't think so. It really does um, serve a certain interest to have oil busted back to 10 to 20 bucks a barrel to sort of shake out the competition and create the independence or interdependence, rather, that we had before. Um, but the dollar is you know, no longer the currency of pure choice for oil and gas and energy generally. Energy is going to flatten out. Uh, there's a lot of risk for the oil industry, and I think the taps are open wide to drain the last dollar out of the industry that I think in the long run fails because alternate energies, even the conventional but even the unconventional, are, I think, at our doorstep. At the same time, moneyed interest, the big interest, control 300 families, half the wealth on the planet. They'd like to keep it. Uh, there's a lot of people on the planet that don't think they ought to anymore. And so, you know, that's going on, and that changes the dynamic. I think that's a big deal. I think the more people talk about that, uh, the better off we all are sort of looking at that. Because I don't think there's a shortage. Seven billion people can be adequately supported by the resources that exist on the planet. What we have to shake is the manipulation of currencies and economic economies and these uh, false, uh, the, really the falsehood of scarcity, when in fact there's abundance, particularly in the creativity arena, we're solving our problems. And I think that's the big challenge. So on the other end of all the bad news is, in my view, uh, solutions to all of this through the very technologies that have the chance of either wiping us out or liberating us to what we potentially could be doing. Well, you, you just touched on something that is very key, and that is once you, you realize that there are people out there, vested interests that profit off of human suffering, they try right. to create more human suffering right. because they profit off of it. And you know, I, I can quote you a half a dozen examples, whether it's illegal drugs, whether it's the prison industry, whether it's you know, uh, uh, you know, just a number of things out there. that, right. that, 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 that pharmaceutical that, industry, I mean – Name everyone that has a lot of money going into lobbyists, and you've got the answer. You know, and yeah. it's really easy to track. You know, I always like to say, you know, you want to find out where the bribes are being made, follow the bag man. You know, and here's the deal is, in the United States, the bag man has an institution and a set of committees and regulatory bodies, so we've institutionalized the bag man and called it cam campaign contributions and whatever other nonsense that we've hung on it. When it results in the same thing, see, because bribery gets you the same thing. It gets you, it gets you outcomes, influence, and access to politicians. That's the same thing campaign contributions get you. Or you get the bribery after the fact by forming uh, foundations and libraries where people like the Clintons or the Bush family come out of office, go into office with a lot, but come out of it with a treasure trove because, I mean, look at the Clinton Foundation, a billion dollars and eight to ten million dollars salaries for these guys. You know, and who's contributing that money? Every foreign national that ever benefited by any of their public policy, that too, and it's totally legal. It's so after the fact. It's like, hey, nice job, Pat, Pat, Pat. Here's your payoff, and they all here, done here, it. Here's, here's your Bush cut. Giving lectures for a million bucks each, and you can't even speak English. Well, you know, you know what it is? It's really here's here's your cut. You know, this is. Uh... Yeah, or go to the Watergate some evening, some weekend, and watch these congressmen play poker against lobbyists and lose to a pair of twos. On uh, the lobbyist side, they'll, they'll let them win on that pair of twos every single time to a full house and fold. You know, that's a, mm -hmm. just a little handoff. You know, I had a good poker player, congressman. You know, there's more crap that goes on in the real world of how politics works that people don't realize. And a lot of the people selected for political office are not chosen because they're the brightest spots in the world. They've got a nice face. They can say the sound bite, and uh, they do what they're told. And, and they and, are the and, guys and, that are running to the show. They have a great deal of what I call moral flexibility. <laughs> well, that's a nice way of putting it. I think that's, if you don't mind, I might use that someday. So that's a very oh, nice please. Take yeah, I, got it, I got it from Gordon Duff. Moral flexibility is what they look for in these candidates, and that's why they're selected. Because yeah, they'll, they don't they're, want they're, anyone who has ideals or actually stands for something, you know. And here's my rule on that. As you look around and people try to divide us over liberal and conservative, whatever other label they want to create the boogeyman for whatever your belief structure is, 
let it go and start looking for the 80%. You know, look at somebody who's got 80% of the convictions you do and forget about the 20. But if they got 100% of the convictions you do, they're lying to you. <laughs> it's really the way it works. Because you're never going to get there with everybody, you know, but sort of apply that rule and you might take better politicians. No, and forget I, about I, your I, party. The party's yeah, I, over. They're all corrupt, you know. I mean, all they do is feel the same level of mediocrity. Well, they do, and they, they keep doing the, the same retreads. I mean, how many more times is Rick Santorum and Mike Huckabee going to run? I don't know. So and, you know here's the deal on all these guys. We, we, no matter where they start, 90% of them, not all of them, but 90% of them end up in the same place where it's really uh, they've been lost to the idea of power, money, whatever's corrupted them. There are those that, that still want to serve, but in this situation right now, the Congress, the Senate, uh, nothing can get done. There is no possibility of really seeing cohesive, comprehensive legislation out of the Congress because it's not about that. It's about polarization, and now the presidency is about uh, the best version of reality TV in the political arena. And that's not statesmanship, and that's not leadership, and that's the kind of crap I think the American public is tired of. But maybe we got to elect a comedian before we see what we can do uh, at reforming the government. I don't know, but... Um, I think this session, this uh, round, is re reminding everyone about how bad it really is, and at the same time, maybe that infuses the possibilities for uh, what well, happens. You know, and Nick, you, you don't know this about me, but I ran for governor of Arizona in 2006, and I lost to Janet Napolitano. Okay. Okay. And, and the, 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 the issue the issue that I had on that, they'd ask me, well, where do you stand on the issues? And I, and I, I tell people, you know, the question you shouldn't be asking me is about any particular issue. You should be asking me about how I address problem solving because right. the issues are always going to change. And right. do, I, do I solve problems from a, a, a principled and moral position? And right. yes, I do. I, 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 I do my very best at that. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't matter if you're on this issue or that issue. The issues always change. It's always a new issue tomorrow because the, the yeah. problems always change. Right. It's just about governance. And, you know, my father, when he served in the state Senate, behind him, my dad was a Democrat, and behind him was C.R. Lewis, who was at the time John Bircher and big John Bircher in their national affairs as well. And, you know, they would fight like crazy on the floor of the Senate, and then they'd go out to dinner at night together and enjoy each other's company and still be arguing, you know. But they were arguing from the basic of idea that, hey, philosophically, they were a million miles apart, but they were still trying to find a solution to a, a practical matter for the public as a matter of policy. So they would do that um, as adversaries and at the same time as friends, because the ultimate deal was argue and find a solution that you could actually make work. And I think that's what we've lost in, in so much of government. And what people are really asking for is that. How about putting a little more civility back into it? And how about having a debate that's just as lively as the one we have, uh, but keep the civility of it uh, together so that you can still break bread as friends and maybe find a solution at the end of the day instead of just carrying on the combat that leaves the Congress with a 7% popularity rating. So bad you wouldn't even fail them in school if you were a teacher. They'd be in remedial education for a few years trying to catch up. Well, 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 it's all a point of view, and you know the the crowd we have now running the government. You know, yeah. I've always thought that you know the the mission of government is how do you do the most good for the most people, the most effectively. Right. And and, and right. these guys don't see it that way. Like I oh, said, no. they're 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 busy kowtowing to those who profit off of human suffering. Right, that's true, and I think that's again a lot of it is just the way we put money in the equation, how that operates. I mean, my view is. I don't think limiting terms is the answer. I think that's that would even make it worse. Uh, actually, what I think we need to do is flatten the money. You know, if they're going to give freedom of speech to corporations, for God's sake, I can't imagine this, but I guess they have. We need to then cap it all at 100 bucks. You know, whether you're an individual or corporation, 100 bucks each, that's all you can give. 100 bucks is the case. Everybody's is. equal. Well, the, the and other, now the thing. try and run an election without people that actually believe in you and actually put some shoe leather on your campaign, because that's the only way you're going to win. Well, the, the, the other issue is, is we have McCain-Feingold. And before, yeah, McCain, right. before McCain-Feingold, if you were a congressman from Iowa, you had to raise your money in Iowa. Right. And after right. McCain fine gold, you can go anywhere in the country to, to get your money. You can go to New York, you can go to Hollywood, you can go to Florida, anywhere you right. want to go. Ra raise money, just get elected. And, right. and, 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 that's, and that is a problem. I mean, look at Alaska is a good example of that. Is we only have 750,000 people, more or less, that live in the whole state, and only a couple hundred thousand are even registered to vote. 
and they spent sixty million on sides on just one U.S. Senate race. You know, and that's just insane. I mean, you could have solved homelessness in our larger city with that kind of money and an endowment forever. You know, on you're, one you're, campaign cycle. You're, you're looking at about to the point where you, it doesn't even make any sense because it doesn't need to make sense. It's about power, it's about money, and it's about influence. It's about corruption. Whether you're running across the border to America from Mexico or in America being enslaved in some weird in some weird thing that makes you think you're free, it's the same game. It's uh, corruption at its core. And that's really what people need to attack to get to the root of all of the symptoms that you deal with in your show program by program, because those are the underlying symptoms of corruption of the human spirit manifest in government, manifest in business, the arts, politics, anywhere human beings play, religion, I don't care where it is. And that's the corruption that needs to end. And that's where uh, a different way of looking at the secrecy syndrome of the country in terms of our technology, in terms of our military science and other areas, we need a very different approach. If, uh, if we're going to remain free uh, as human beings, as souls on this planet, or it's, or it's totally slavery, and that's where we're headed, uh, and the opportunity to change is really now the very technologies that can carry us either direction. Well, I, I think you're right. I think we're at a very, very critical tipping point, and uh, you know which side of the line it falls on is uh, yet to be determined. I'm, I'm hoping for the, the freedom and prosperity side, not the slavery and poverty side. I'm with you, and I and I think it's possible. I think it's uh, it is at the end. I think the out, inevitable outcome. We may go through a rocky road to get there, but I think that's where we're headed. And uh, I remain optimistic. I think people should remain optimistic. Do what you can. Do what you believe in. That's the way things change. That's the way uh, the world changes, one step at a time, with people acting on they what on what they know to be right and true. And, and honoring that with the actions that we each individually take. I think that's well, as simple as it gets. That's the freedom of uh, the sovereign man, the individual soul, and one person or a small group. Well, well, one of the issues we have here is that so many people are so malinformed by the mainstream media <laughs> that right. they, they don't know. They, 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 they watch Fox News. They see the pretty girl. The pretty girl says this is true. They believe it. Yeah, I don't watch the news anymore. I gave it up uh, six years ago, best thing I ever did. And I, I, I seek out the news. I take and tap into the, the global news feed according to my, my need rather than the other way around. Because as long as you're tapping into it sort of selectively, looking at those things that are of interest to you that you can do something with, uh, that's a very, there's a lot out there. You can get anything you want, any way you want it. But why be the program? Why be programmed by the news, which is the way most of us function within our society? Well, that, that, that's why they call it programming, because right, it, you're not that, watching the they're, program. they're not talking you about the, the lineup. They're, they're talking about the response they want out of you. They're, they're programming right. you your, your, and your kids as you watch it every day. Right. Yeah, I think even about one of the leading S networks, to even tell you right up front, it's CBS, CBS. They even tell you right up front. CBS, I mean, you know, there you go. You get right down to it, even the metaphor hits you right in the head, and you don't even see it. But the fact of the matter is, that really is the metaphor, isn't it, for the 21st century? It media. is. Yeah, and and that's better. where we are. So be selective in what you read, be critical in what you see and think, and when people want to change your mind, look it up. See whether it hey. makes sense, because most of it is T. Yeah. Nick, Nick, we're, we're, we're at a break point, so hang on, folks. We'll be right back in a few minutes more with uh, Nick Begich and Dr. Richard Allen Miller. We'll be right back after the short break. Well, good evening and welcome back. This is Mike Harris broadcasting on www.veteranstoday.com. Also broadcasting on www.freedomslips.com, Studio B, Revolution Radio. Today is Thursday, February 18th, 2016. And our guests for this uh, final half hour are Dr. Richard Allen Miller and uh, Mr. Nick Begich. Welcome back, gentlemen. Hey, it's good to be back with you, and Richard just stepped away for a moment, but he'll be right back. Okay, so, good, good. Well, well, Nick, why don't we talk a little bit about uh, your program up here in Ashland? Uh, why don't Why don't we, uh, you know, just give them an overview? Most people are not going to be uh, able to attend. You know, like I said, it's a limited venue, maybe eighty people. Right. But why don't right. Why don't we talk about this a little bit? And, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, sh- share what uh, what what the program is going to be. Okay, it's um, it's going to be tomorrow night, Friday, February 19th, from 7 to 9 p.m., and it's going to be at The Haven, 
which is at 1970 Ashland Street in Ashland, Oregon. And um, it's a suggested donation, five bucks to get in. Uh, there's 80 people, and we're going to talk about HARP, and we're going to talk about mind control, mind effects. A related technology is going to be the main subject matter. And, you know, this, you know, we, in the last segment, we were talking about personal privacy and um, personal liberty and just sort of the underlying theme of that, at least for me, when I look at, you ask me, what are the top things? This would be the top item on the list for me in the sense that you think about uh, free choice, uh, free will, if you will, something that even um, in most religions, uh, traditions, God doesn't even interfere with. This is uh, what man is manipulating, the idea of manipulating human behavior is so uh, repugnant, at least to me, I consider it the most important issue. Because, you know, think about everything we do, you know, anything about the First Amendment or any of it, you know, I mean, it's all predicated on free thought, right? I mean, to be able to think freely is so fundamental to what we are. Who would have ever thought that this would be the purview of uh, experimentation by governments or manipulation? Uh, but really, that's really it. And when you think about the power of manipulation, just in the simple forms of propaganda and what that could do to the population of Germany prior to World War II and then the atrocities that came, uh, you know, in the next you know, four years of that war. Uh, when you think about how easy it is to move populations and you start laying on it, again, these technologies, that to me is um, sort of the biggest and most important thing. So we'll talk about that in that context. But then on the flip side of that is sort of the other side of it. What can you do to enhance human performance, I mean, given what we've learned about the brain for sort of weapons applications or manipulation for the wrong reasons, what do we know is coming? And what does that represent? What do we know is here right now? I mean, can we do things that improve our, um, our brain coherence so that both hemispheres, right and left, work together? Well, we can. Uh, and so we'll demonstrate some of that technology in the lecture. We'll talk about it and talk about how to improve the way the brain functions. You know, people always ask me, what's the defense against all that stuff? You know, it's sharpen how your physical body works in conjunction with the rest of your system, uh, and then your thinking will be more clear and your possibilities greater. And that's really the direction in which I think. Okay, um, you let, let, me, let me read between the lines here a little bit. Did I just hear you say we need to exercise so we think better? Yeah, there's a lot of things. I mean, just simple things like breathing as an example. Um, if you uh, engage in things like rhythmic breathing, and there's a lot of traditions that even talk about this, what it does is it sets up the situation. First of all, you oxygenate the brain, which is kind of a, a no-brainer, right? <laughs> the part of the fun. But then the other part of it is you, you actually, um, in certain kinds of rhythmic breathing, the brain slows down and falls into a certain rhythm uh, around 7 or 8 hertz, pulses per second or vibrations per second. This is associated with uh, the low alpha state, associated again with creative thinking and a lot of really powerful kind of work that you do is, uh, with your brain in terms of learning environments and creative work, where you want to be for being awake and aware, so to speak. Um, you know, so when you think about just something as simple as that, uh, and then you can apply certain technologies like brain biofeedback techniques that teach you, uh, for instance, in the forehead, your forehead and your muscles in your forehead will get tense when you're stressed out. You can measure that with what are called muscle Tensiometers, real simple feedback loop that measures um, uh, electrical uh, uh, characteristics in the, in the muscles that then feedback and give you a tone. So you get a feedback in the ear of a tone when you're stressed, and the tone changes as you relax, as those muscles relax. So you can get a feedback system set up to actually learn how to relax or dissipate stress and fall into that state where the brain works more creatively, more analytically, less of the herd mentality or the flight or fight response associated with more incoherent kind of brain patterns. So you can apply technologies. You can use even drivers, light, flickering light, uh, a certain sound signals generated in a certain way. You can create what's called entrainment, where the brain locks on to those external signals and begins to mirror them. If you were to look at an EEG, you'd see that mirroring effect where the brain actually then falls into these states. So instead of learning how to do it yourself, you can actually drive it with an external generator. So instead of driving someone, say, to be angry and riotous, you would drive a state on your own that might put you in a state where you can learn really easily and then maybe you jack in a language tape and learn a language at a more accelerated rate, this kind of thing. And this is sort of the flip side of that sword, right? I mean, what, which way do you go with the technologies? Because as we learn the principles on how the brain works, how it 
can accept information, how to broadcast information, and how, sort of how it functions as, as circuitry, if you will, then the overlays become much different, you know, in terms of what we might be uh, might be doing. And so then again, for education, think about this. In, in 40 years, one of the things that the military is looking for right now is the idea of taking memory sets, being able to take a complete memory set and sort of dumping it into your brain as a quick training course of an hour. Well, let, so. let, let, me, let me give you an example, because when you watch the movie The Matrix, and uh, there's a scene in there where he says, I learned Kung Fu. You know, I've been training 47 years uh, in the martial arts. If this guy right. can pick this pick this up with one brain dump and, and, and be able to perform that well, hey, that, that that's that's an extraordinarily valuable uh, set of or the scene where uh, she needs to fly a helicopter. She doesn't know how. Right. They they, they, right. they download it to her immediately. This is uh, right. this is the concept they're working on, right? That DARPA let a couple contracts out at the University of California a few years ago to kind of start to pursue that that line. All right, and. How far you go and how much is in the public is a fraction of what probably is really out there. But this is a direction. And now when you think about that, uh, think about that in 20, 30 years being now applied out of this military sector of education. People go, oh, wow, that would be great. Well, maybe, maybe, but it doesn't do it. It does a couple things differently, right? It bypasses the conscious and subconscious in a way that it's sort of you don't have any critical thinking going on. It's just a download, right? I mean, you don't have the sort, you don't have the moral question, the moral compass applied. So whoever controls the curriculum that, at that point in time controls a great deal about moral compass of the planet as well. And this is, again, the direction in which science is going, and, and you can expect to see it in 20 or 30 years. So now is probably a good time to debate how far shall we go, right? And who's going to run the curriculum? Who decides what people know and what they believe? Because after all, the root of belief, as, as Richard was saying earlier, is sort of the, the, the root of creation, right? That's how it all springs forth. So controlling the belief system of human beings is what politics ultimately is about, what commercial advertising is all about, uh, what all of it is all about. And we're just taking it to deeper, higher resolution levels that we as public should be as concerned as they were 200 years ago about people kicking your doorway in and invading your privacy. The privacy venue has changed, but the spirit of revolution in terms of protecting that should not change. Well, that, that, that's because you're right. It, it was uh, before they would just kick in your door and ransack your house and search through all your, your private papers, if you will. Uh, yeah. but, but, but today we've got this, this gaping wide open thing here. You know, you, you uh, called uh, you know, whatever your web browser is, whether it's Google or, or Firefox, whatever. Right. They, they, they track everything you do. I mean, they're on yeah. it like, yeah. like a dog on a bone. Yeah. And so here's what I think in terms of the, 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 a simple piece of legislation is make it a criminal offense to retain data on anybody unless there's a commercial reason and you can point to it. And those usually expire within six months of the transaction unless you've got a contract that runs longer and they usually expire within a seven-year cycle. And all that data, whatever that contractual relationship is, they disappear at the end of that six months when the credit card bill has been due and the dispute can't happen or whatever that is. But your searches, all of that data, that should belong to each of us individually. It does not belong to corporations. I don't care whether they generate it or not. It doesn't belong to anybody but us individually, and we ought to be in control of the data. And we need to make sure the Congress understands what privacy means in the 21st century. And that would be a good starting point. And violations shouldn't be civil. They shouldn't be go sue some civil corporation that doesn't even breathe. It ought to be throw boards in jail and people responsible for it in jail. Now you're so talking the, because the that's, that I've been an advocate for that yeah. for a long time. Yeah. That, that, that I, I've been advocating for holding the boards of directors and the top 50 managers from these corporations. Hold them accountable. Put them in jail. Put them in jail, man. And, you know, we had the biggest bank robbery in history, right, a trillion dollars, and you get more for sticking up a 7 Eleven. You know, this, this is it's upside down. The guys who belong in prison ought to be making big rocks into little rocks or running around chiseling out grandma's Social Security check for the next big scam. And that's well, that, 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 that's the point. You know, and what's so sad about this, when the, big, when the big banks got themselves in trouble in 2007 and eight, is that we had a process in place. It's called bankruptcy. <laughs> and if you, right. if, you guys, if you guys screwed up, you go bankrupt, and, and your big bank becomes a thousand little banks. But oh right. no, but oh no, yep. the, 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 cri the criminals who own our, our legislators and own our White House convince them that no, no, we need a bailout. 
Uh, we're, we're, we're not taking a haircut on, on this. Nice one. The opposite, right? I mean, they put yes. their bankers in jail. They took the banks away from them. They, pro- they propped them up with public money. The public paid the bill. And then at the end of the day, the public got their money back, and the banks were solvent, but they weren't owned by the shareholders and the bondholders. They were all, well, sorry, guys, you lost, and the other guys who ran the show, they're in jail where they belong. And you know what? It worked much better for them to put their money on the people rather than on the players, and the players lost and got what they deserved. But at the end of the day, they got a strong economy, and I you know, well, well, and, well, and they're well, already recovered and moving on. You know, they're not worrying and, about and, what and happened. What happened? We've not, re- we've not people recovered were yet. Accountable for the first time. We've not recovered yet. And the thing is, I, I think we've got another big bank meltdown coming here because we've got yeah, we this. Uh, I, I agree. The, with you. Probably the, by, this, by seventeen, I would say sometime the fall of seventeen, we're in for. Well, we, we've got this oil derivatives exposure that these banks have. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're selling derivative contracts at 130 right. bucks a barrel and oil selling for under $30 a barrel now. So I don't know how much longer they can prop that up. But well, but the, the the public piggy bank is empty. There, there's no yeah. more money to bail them out. So now yeah. we're going to have to put them through the bankruptcy process. It, it, and yeah. boy, it will be so welcome. Just so welcome. I'm, I'm so sick of J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo right. and them. all yeah. of them. I'm sick of these Bank of America. Let's end them. <laughs> yeah, you know, we take, we should put the, the the printing of money back with the Treasury and get rid of this whole thing. Absolutely. You know, it, 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 it was an it, interesting it, experiment. It ran 100 years, and it failed. And here's the thing on the Fed side. You know, they still haven't audited. My brother was one of the few Democrats who wanted the Fed audited from, ni- from 1913 to the finish line. And they did this little sort of uh, selective audit. Maybe you saw it from 2008 mm-hmm. to 2012. And... You know, everybody's excited about the $1.2 trillion that the Fed created a, in, in debt during that time for the U.S., but they did $16 trillion, $16 trillion that they loaned out to other banks in the world as well as our own, whether they were well, national well, banks. Not, or not banks. to foreign banks, exactly, exactly right. right. And that $16 trillion, most people don't even know about. You know, they're saying $16 trillion national debt. Hey, wait a minute. You know, the Fed created $16 trillion just in four years. What did they do before then, and what have they done since? Nobody even knows. But well, I can let tell me, you this: let me make, let me they make didn't do any, They didn't do nothing. They didn't stand still. You know, I mean, how much have they rolled up, and who's responsible for it? I'd say turn the Fed off. Say sorry, guys, didn't work out. You know, and pay the treasuries <laughs> off, and start again with the treasury owning the right of producing the money like it's supposed to. Well, <clears throat> absolutely. And the bottom line here is, is that. This whole Rothschild banking empire that uh, every every bank except for five countries uh, are are wired into it. They screwed right. up. They 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 made the wrong bets. They right. they screwed up. And you know what? They they kept themselves in place by uh, bribing the system. Like you said, political contributions right. are bribes. It's, it's, it's no different. And, hey, and, for and, a and, million and, bucks, you make a few billion. I'd say, hey, you know, they got the idea. You know, they know the equation. They even joked about it in Alaska as the international oil industry hijacked our, our oil up there. You know that on the north slope of Alaska, on federal land, still on federal land, the amount of oil and gas that has not yet been leased, that we ought not to lease to these guys, is enough to pay off the national debt, $16 trillion worth of value at least in just oil and gas in Alaska. You know, Alaska is 20% of the land mass in the United States. We have more coastline than east, west, and Gulf Coast combined. And we got oil resources and gas resources run this country for a thousand years. And the fact is, we own it in common. It's our public lands. And we're letting these oil industry, oil companies, multinationals hijack it. And they just bribe our legislature with their contributions for a few million a year and uh, mothball it here while they rape the rest of the world because they got the best deal going. They got a safety deposit box back by the U.S. military near the blood of our sons and daughters uh, to protect their multinational wealth uh, as they hijack the wealth of nations. And they're doing it here again, and they've been doing it for 200 years. And there's nothing new here, whether it was tea getting knocked off a ship or barrels of oil being slipped out of Alaska through the pipeline. It's our resource. We're being robbed of it. And the fact is, we could solve our problems, and instead we have our problems. We got to change the game and recognize the wealth of nations that our founding fathers came here to make sure we would share in common in a responsible and positive way to a capitalistic republic. And hey, we've missed it, folks. We've missed it. 
Well, well, Nick, you're, you're talking about what I refer to as the theft of the commons. And yeah. uh, it doesn't matter if it's natural resources. It doesn't matter if it's the water treatment plant. Right. The, the taxpayers built it. They paid for it. Then yep. they, they, they pay the government, uh, the government officials and the bureaucrats to mismanagement, then sell it to a private entity for a song who turns around yeah. and raises, raises the rates. And uh, right. the people end up paying for, the, for the same asset twice. We already paid hey, for it. We even do it with a lot of pharmaceuticals. A lot of that basic research paid for by government grants. You know, and you know, the, you know that sixty percent of your medical costs are pharmaceuticals. Most people don't realize it. Sixty percent of the bill is pharmaceuticals at the end of the day, and of that, forty percent of the money is on advertising that they spend in venues that you and I can't even make a decision to buy the pharmaceutical because they're all restricted drugs, and you, know, you can't advertise cigarettes in those venues, right? I mean. They shouldn't be allowed to advertise. Shouldn't be allowed to deduct it. You'd shave forty percent off of uh, pharmaceuticals right out of the gate. If you made a rule that any federal purchase through any or any insurance purchase in the United States was uh, uh, pharmaceutical could not be sold for one one dime more than any place else in the world. Whoa! Wouldn't that flatten the whole program out? Oh, under all ab- 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 in the absolutely, US, but absolutely. We we, we pay place. we pay ten times what any other country in the in the on the planet pays for pharmaceuticals. Yep, all you, you have know, to do is a thousand percent law, higher. You pass that law of the land, and then you create a whistleblower mechanism that rewards people for telling on these assholes, and it's over. The pharmaceutical industry loses its potential to rip us all off, which is what they are doing, and it sets a playing field and says, look, if we're going to pay, play and pay, and you're in the safest place in the world where you get contract protection, protection of the courts, protection of our military, protection of everything else. You know what? The one thing you're not going to be protected from is looting this country. And when you look at medical industry, the only place where they don't have to post their prices, you go get your car fixed by somebody who does a complex job of fixing the car in 21st century, and you know what it's going to cost before you walk out and before you walk in. But you can't figure it out in the med- medical industry. You want to talk about a monopoly, a manipulated program, look at the industry from start to finish. And if the problems can be resolved when you bust down why are they existing. It's because of vested, greedy interest where venture capitalists come in and buy up companies and go run, run medical prescriptions from a buck and a half to a few hundred because they can get away with it. They usually do it the other way, though. They bring them out with a couple hundred, sell them for two dollars somewhere else, and take as much as they can from the market that'll pay them and whoever they can bribe, excuse me, contribute to uh, so that they can get their will. That's just wrong. It's just fundamentally wrong, and Americans should stand up. It's not capitalism. It's greed and something else that's even uglier, in my opinion. Uh, that's really? not the way the country it, it, was it, built. That's not the way it's going to sustain. And going forward, it's the only solutions are you have to take the power away from those who have corrupted the use of it. And our founding fathers warned us it's happened. We don't need a violent revolution. We need a revolution in thinking, and we need to grab these guys uh, and, and, and change the game. Oh, I, I, I absolutely agree. I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I am all for, uh, you know, jailing the boards of directors and the top 50 manager for, for, for these, uh, these companies. But the other thing that's happened is the private equity market, uh, you know, the, 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 the KKRs and those guys. Whenever Reagan came through and wanted to deregulate everything to create more competition, it had the opposite effect. Everything's been right. consolidated. We used to have, uh, you know, 55 national carrier airlines. We're down to right. four. We used right. to have 150 television networks across the country. We're down to six. Right. Every facet is is controlled by fewer and fewer people. Everything right. that, that that interacts with humanity in any way is, is going through fewer and fewer hands. And it's right. time to break that up. And uh, you know, a I great agree. place a great place would be to start with the banks. And, yeah, uh, I agree. And, you, know, you know, banking. You know, what should banking maybe look like? Maybe the banking needs to be nationalized again. You know, well, I, 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 I absolutely think it should. And, uh, yeah, and so that money supply is really controlled by government and it's loaned out at a reasonable rate of interest cut like that's associated with maybe the cost of printing it and managing the loans, you know, and the default rates instead of these arbitrary. Well, I, 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 like the model, the, uh, I like the model that the productivity of the country, how much yeah. you increase your GDP is how much you increase your money supply. Yeah, your money right. supply – it is validated by the productivity of the nation, and right. everybody, and, you know, everybody's got a, got a piece supply. of. It's everybody's a got a stake anyway. in the game. 
But money supply is false anyway. You know, we used to track M1, M2, M3, all that stuff. They don't even really do that anymore. But when you think about money supply, most of it's been created by banks as credits. I mean, look at the money supply increase from the advent well, of credit cards. Money, card money is not money. We're, we're, we're not talking. Money doesn't exist as we know it. Right. Money is nothing of value. Money is a, is a debt. Yeah, it is not, what that is. It's just airspace is a, got a, a sucking sound attached to it, you know? <laughs> you know. And and here's the thing about it is, it's a great medium for exchange. And you're right, you increase it with the productivity so that it doesn't create inflation or deflation. It basically is, it goes as that exchange between goods and service to increase with the increase in goods and services it makes way better sense. And let the government control it, not a bunch of banks charging us and playing the debt game. Do it differently, and and we could do it differently, and 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 I think in the if you look at the experiment of the country over its 200-year life, there's been a lot of different attempts to do national banking, and the Federal Reserve was the latest one, and, and I chalk it up as a failure that's running from itself because they won't even submit to a full external audit. That's a problem. Well, it is, and, and the nation. it is, and, and it's time to. Uh, when the next banking crisis comes, it's time to, to force all these banks and the Fed to declare yep. bankruptcy. And, yeah, and I agree. We'll, we'll go in and, and uh, break it up and redistribute the assets among other people. Because yep. these guys obviously don't know what they're doing. They, they, yeah, don't know how, they don't know how to run an economy. Yeah, I agree. You know, when, when, uh, when Mark was in, this, in the Senate and Bernanke calls him all screaming at him, you know, because he, was, he wanted to... Audit. We audit every year. We audit every year. Bernanke says, "We we and he goes really." He goes, "Yeah, we have internal audits every year." And he goes, "Well, my brother says, well, well, great. Then you, you won't have any problem with an external audit, should you?" <laughs> and he hung up on him. You know, that was the end of it. You know, it's like hey, these guys don't get it. His accountability runs all different directions, and saving the bankers was the biggest theft since the railroad barons. I mean, this was bad. I mean, Or maybe you have to line up the SNL bailout, which is kind of the same thing. People already have amnesia. Forgot about well, that. Well, we, we've, had, we've had three big scams, three big financial scams since we had the SNL bailout. We had the dot-com bubble, which was a classic pump and dump. Right. Then, then we had this mortgage fraud thing. And, right. and, right. and, and the, these are three big scams that have fleeced the American people. And they have particularly fleeced the pension funds. So now we're yeah. in a situation where the pension funds, where people you know work their whole life, they put money in for their pension, and uh, it's time to collect, and there's nothing there because the yeah. banks stole it all. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And and, and and so and so here you are, you have it, you know. And then the false reporting of a of a happy talk economy by the mainstream media, when in fact people used to have jobs that paid eighty or ninety grand a year, working on assembly lines, building things that mattered. Are now working at Seven Eleven at fifteen grand a year and being counted as employees. No offense to those that are working those hard jobs. The reality is, the opportunities have diminished for 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 improving ourselves within the country. Not because of a lack of the basic factors of an economy, which is entrepreneurship, land and natural resources, um, capital equipment, things that build things. You know, labor. Uh, those are the things that that build countries. Uh, you know, and, and entrepreneurship. And we have all of that here. Uh, we have 20% of our land mass in Alaska with more natural resources than we ever had in all the western states combined, uh, being neglected uh, for lack of policy and lack of creativity and thinking on how to put the country back to work with our market advantages, which are all of those things, which is why we used to have half the economy of the world and there's just one country. Well, well, I think well, the country well, Nick, isn't over. I think this, we no, have I, a lot of opportunities, and what we're missing is the kind of leadership that uh, well, brings about change, and technology drives so much of that. Today. We're, we're, we're at that key inflection point. We, we, we truly are, and it, it's time for, for people to stand up and do the right thing the, the right way unless they want to be on the slavery and poverty side. But you know, yeah, I agree. Totally agree. I, hey, and, and I know we're getting close to the end of the the hour. I just let Richard say something to you, you and your audience before we have to sign off for the day. Okay, very well, Nick. Thank you so much. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. Hope to have you back on again soon. I, I think I we're. I, thank you very much. I, I think we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg here. I, hey, I, I hear you. Here he is. Hey there, Mike. Hey, Rick Miller. How are you, sir? <laughs> My usual response is, "I'm going bald." From yes, unnatural curses. Yeah, I pulled it out. <laughs> okay, okay cl- closing comments. Anything you want to tell the people before we run out of air, t- air-, air time here? Well, um, 
Hollywood event should start something off. I think that municipalities are starting to realize their fr fragility and are trying to warn the public in a variety of ways that it's time to start processing more independence. Your water is first, with food second. And so people are starting to buy locally more because, like, just here in Grants Pass, the, the, the food is, we've got literally half the food in Grants Pass, both, um, um, what are the two stores? The Hagen's, Hagen's are closed, up for auction, and Ray's. That's four stores of, of a Safeway and, and the other. And because of that, Walmart, at, well, well, Winco has just opened. It's literally the, half the food is on the shelves in, in, in Grants Pass, Oregon. And the public hasn't noticed yet. Well, Rick, Rick, we're, we're out of time, sir. I've got to let you go, but thank you so much, and thank Nick you as bet. well. Thank you. Have, yeah, have my a good pleasure, evening. Mike. Glad we helped. All right. Bye-bye.